Sorry for the delay, this was because we tested it in the, during the break. So I'm very thankful to the ISI for making me a fellow of the ISI. And when I thought about my scientific vision for the future, then I thought about predicting success. What do I mean by this? There are many smart scientists in this room, and many of us are also project managers in these or the other way. We host European projects, and of course, the grant agency is interested in just one question. Will our project be successful? Of course, we work on early indicators to measure the failure or the success of projects based on a social network and a sentiment analysis. But even one level below this general question, we already know about one condition for success. This is to allocate the resources that we have available to the right problems and not to the wrong problems. That means we should be able to distinguish between the solvable and the unsolvable problems before we actually carry out the problem. To look into one specific example, let us take the Firefox project. We have data available for a time frame of about 10 years, and Firefox, as you probably know, is supported by a very large community. For example, there are 55,000 registered unique bug reporters. And these 55,000 bug reporters have filed 113,000 bug reports during this time frame, which roughly means 1,000 bucks per month. No one can handle this number of uh, bug reports, so actually only 57% of all these bug reports were uh, resolved which means roughly 64,000. And if you look into the success of this resolvement process, then you find out that only 20% of the bug reports were valid, and 80% of these bug reports were faulty. In loose words, it means that you have allocated your workforce of 80% to bug reports just to find out that these bug reports will never lead to any improvement of the software, right? Therefore, the question is, do we have other possibilities to identify a successful bug report before actually resolving the bug report? And the method that we propose here for now and also for future uh, uh, analysis is to look into social network analysis. That means we look into the social position of the bug reporters in a network. And how does the social network in a bug handling community looks like? It looks like this. There is a person A that uh, reports a bug, then a person B uh, forwards this bug report to other person C and D. A person F is able to reproduce a bug. It also forwards the bug report to a person uh, uh, <coughs> that is able to reproduce it again. Another person changes something about this bug report and assigns it to a developer, and this developer assigns it to another developer, and the other developer actually solves the problem. So this is a usual life uh, of a bug report if the bug report is handled successfully. What we analyze now is the social network of all the interactions between these developers. And of course, as you can imagine, this social network changes in every time step. Therefore, we have uh, divided this data set into time slices of one month, e one month each. And then we look into how the social position of a bug reporter has changed after the bug report was successfully resolved. And what we find out is shown <coughs> is that indeed we can use this information to classify bugs. So what we did is a similar, uh, it's a machine learning approach very similar to what Phil mentioned before. We uh, uh, developed a, a <coughs> piece of software uh, to 
uh, use this information from the social network analysis. We measure different quantities of the social position of each of these bug reporters and how it developed over time. Then we use a very small data set, only 5% of the data to train uh, this vector machine and then allows it to uh, resolve uh, or to classify the bugs, whether they are faulty and valid. So let us look into the result. Remember that 50,000 of these bugs were faulty bugs. And with uh, the support vector machine, with this classifier, we were able to uh, detect 97% of these bugs. And if you look into the position, then you see that although the correctly classified percentage is very high. So this is a very optimistic result because it basically tells us that we do not re really need to look into the bug report. We just need to trace the social position of the bug report. That's the important information. So the suggestion then is that we use social network analysis to get additional insight into the success, and in this particular case, the success of a bug report uh, to be, uh, uh, to be re validly resolved. And we want, also want to use this to predict the future performance of, for example, a bug report or other uh, products. And the very system that comes to our mind is, of course, science. We are scientists, and we may be interested in the bug reporting community of Firefox, but we are even more interested in our own community and would like to have a tool available that predicts success in science. How do we define success? In this case, we measure the number of citations that a published paper will receive over a couple of years. And we call a paper is successful if it makes it to the top 10 of all published papers in the respective field, for example, physics or computers. So the top 10 is really a hard uh, uh, barrier. Okay. Of course, there is a question that we should answer first. So does the social position of an author of a paper really matter? What we tell our graduate students, of course, is that the quality of the paper matters, right? And this is what they have to learn and that they have to improve the quality of the paper. But at the same time, we know that the paper that we have produced should also be known in the community, which essentially means that the authors have to become known in the community. So why don't we try a little experiment similar to this big atlas experiment that I show you on this uh, figure here. We assume that the social position of a co-author, one of these guys here, the social position of this co-author gives an indication of whether this paper will be among the top 10 papers in this field in five years from now. That's the experiment. What we do actually is the same as before. We run a social network analysis. We look into different criteria. We trace different authors here. Every author is traced over time with respect to his success and also with respect to the social position here. Then you see how this changes. This is just an example of a co-authorship network. And these are the results. So there are four different uh, uh, areas that we have investigated. And you see uh, that we are able to predict about 60% uh, of success. So if you think that the prediction number is bad, then you should think twice. If you compare this to a random guess, then getting one of these 10% papers is only 10%. That means our classifier is five to six times better in predicting the success of the second number here is a recall. If you think that the recall number is bad, then you should also think twice. Remember what the experiment means. The experiment means I predict the success of your paper five years from now only based on your social position in the network. 
right? And then we can say, thanks God, that only 20% of all these papers can be entirely traced back to the social position of the authors of the paper in previous times. And 80% are left, of course, to uh, people that come new to the field and also make a, an important paper. So let me conclude this. There's a good news and a bad news that we can derive from this kind of analysis, and uh, it's almost the same, or, or the same, namely that science is done by people. That's a famous quote by Heisenberg. Of course, this was intuitively known to us that science is done by people and that our social network matters in scientific success, but the difference now is we can quantify to what extent the social network matters to make our paper successful. Let me underline again that this is important only for good papers to become top papers among the 10%. You will not be able to leverage this method to make a bad paper a top paper, right? That's for sure. And the conclusion from this is, of course, if you treat this seriously, then you have to invest a lot into networking, but you, of course, should also write uh, good papers. So if you want to deal with this question of predicting success, then this is a research program that I propose, for example, for people interested at the ISI. The first step is to understand the impact of social networks. So far, people mostly dealt with the topology of social networks. They dealt with the dynamics of social networks, but they rarely dealt with the impact of social networks. Namely, what does it mean for other quantities to have this and that kind of structure in the social network? And as I try to convince you with these starting examples, there is big data out there to wait to be analyzed with respect to the social influence. The second step in this research program is we should try to leverage social information, for example, about the network position in a similar way as I have described in this example. That means we should use a machine learning approach. We should be able to uh, develop support vector machines or classifiers in general to predict other quantities, quantities that are not, are not directly uh, visible in the social network. And the third important thing is that we have to be aware of the filter bubble. That means if we are able to predict things just by looking into the social network, then this also means that a lot of information is missing that is outside this social network simply because it is not reflected. That's called the uh, filter bubble. And we have to develop tools to measure the size of the filter bubble to also get an idea of what is missing in our approaches. And with this little research program, I thank for your attention.